Good afternoon and welcome to the Society for Developmental Biology's first annual postdoctoral seminar series. We're excited to highlight the work of our outstanding postdoctoral members. Today, Jubo Nu from Massachusetts General Hospital and Soledad Reyes de Mochel from the University of California, San Francisco will share their research. Each speaker will be given a 20 minute talk followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box during their, speak, during their talks. Our first speaker, Zhubo Nu, received his PhD from Zhenjiang University in China. His research was performed in the laboratory of Dr. Jinrong Peng, where he studied liver development using zebrafish as a model. In early 2014, Zhubo joined the Galloway Lab in Boston, where he studies tendon biology in zebrafish. Jubo's focus in the Galloway lab is to study tendon cell regeneration following ablation and also tenogenic differentiation of stem cells. Outside of science, Jubo likes reading, watching movies, and cooking. Welcome, Jubo. We look forward to your talk. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for the nice introduction. So first of all, I'd like to thank the meeting organizer for selecting me and give me this opportunity to speak to you. And today I'm very happy to be here to share with you part of my research that is the tendon cell regeneration in zebrafish. And uh, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, how we use the zebrafish study tendon cell regeneration and how that process can be regulated. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the tendon. So as you can see here, tendon is a connective tissue that connects the muscle to the bone. And like most of the tissue, the tendon is, a, is made of tendon cell, which is also called a tenocyte. And the tendon also have many matrix, for example, the type one collagen. And the tendon injury is a problem that can affect a significant portion population. However, so far, there are very few treatments for tendon injury, which could be due to a pretty understanding of the tendon biology. For example, we know much little about uh, how to make a functional tendon cell and uh, what is the mechanism that can regulate the tendon repair. So to study the tendon biology here in the gallery lab, we, start, we use zebrafish as a model system. So we were first uh, trying to ask uh, where is the zebrafish tendon? So what I'm showing you here is a 3D zebrafish embryo. And uh, this is a cartoon showing the craniofacial structure. So you can see here, so I use different color to label the different uh, element. So you can see the green is labeling the cartilage, the muscle is labeled in blue, and the red is the tendon. So the bottom here is the antibody staining showing the, in the craniofacial region. Uh, the cartilage and the connector tendon and also the muscle. So the zebrafish has also some tendon cell in their uh, trunk region, which are located to the meroceptor, as you can see here. So years ago, when we started this project, uh, we, were think, we were asking some basic question, that is whether zebrafish can regenerate their tendon cell. And if they can, where are the new cell from? and what are the molecular mechanisms that can regulate this process. So then we were trying to make a transgenic light that can allow us to ablate the tendon cell. So what I'm showing you here is the expression pattern of sclerosis A, which is the earliest marker for tendon progenitor. And it is also expressed by tendon tissue at all stage. For example, if you look at the 3D embryo, you can see Sclerosis A is expressed in the craniofacial region. So here I use different color to label different tendon tissue. And you can also see its expression in the meroceptor and also in the tail region. And right here is the ablation line that we made. And it is mediated by gal 4 UAS system that can drive the expression of EPNTR, which is for exporting NTR. So EPNTR is an enzyme that can convert MTZ into a toxic that can cause cell death. So then we were trying to ask the first question that is whether 
we can ablate the tendon cell. So what you see here is we add either DMSO or MTZ into the uh, water and uh, treat the embryo. So we start at the chemical from 3D to 5D. And uh, here in the top panel is the DMSO control. In the bottom is the MTZ treated fish. So in the DMSO control, you always have the tendon cell. However, in the MTZ treatment, uh, after 2D, you can see the tendon cell has already been ablated. So to confirm the ablation, we also look at the expression of the other tendon marker. For example, the tendon margin, which is the differentiation marker for tendon. And you can see here in the DMSO control, you have the tendon margin expression in the tendon structure. For example, this is the sternal hyoides tendon. And this is the tendon margin signal in the plate corded region. And in the MTZ treated fish, you, the tendon margin signal was gone. So meaning that the tendon cell has been ablated. So next the question we were trying to ask uh, whether the zebra fish can regenerate their tendon cell. So what we did is we first uh, ablated the tendon cell and then we look at the cell regeneration at uh, multiple time points. So for example, if you look at uh, here, the top panel is the DMSO control and the bottom is the MTZ treated fish. So, so the red is the tendon cell. So here I'm just focusing on the, this tendon, uh, which is called a sternal hyoides tendon. And it is also the biggest tendon in the cranial fish region that is evolved in the mouth opening. And the green cell here is the chondrocyte that is labeled by the collagen 2 GFP. And in the DMSO control, you always have the tendon cell. And in the MTZ treated fish after two day treatment, the tendon cell has been ablated. And then after two days, we, we notice there's some cell coming back. And after 40 and 60, there has been a lot of cell return. So this is showing the zebra fish was able to regenerate their tendon cell. And then in order to know whether the zebra fish can eventually regenerate a functional tendon, what we did is we look at the new tendon tissue after six months. For example, we look at their morphology and their structure. So here, if you look at, this is a TM image showing the transverse section of the tendon tissue. So DMSO is the normal tendon and the MTZ is the regenerated new tendon. So you can see here, this is a tendon cell that is surrounded by the collagen fibril. And uh, here is a higher magnification showing the collagen fibril. So you can compare between the DMSO and the new tendon, how much similar they are to each other. And then we were trying to quantify the diameter for each of the collagen fibril and also their area. And we compare between the normal tendon and the new tendon. And as a result, we found they are very comparable to each other. So you can see the pattern very similar. So next the question is we were trying to look for the cellular resource. And we want to know where are the new cell from and what is their identity? So to study the question, we use the sternal hyoides tendon as a model. And we focus on two regions. The first region is the cartilage attachment site, you can see here. And the second one is the muscle attachment site. And we were trying to look for where is the new cell from. So first of all, we first focus on the uh, cartilage attachment side. So when we thought about a cellular resource over here, we were thinking about the Saxton lineage. So the reason for that is in our previous work, we demonstrated in the cranial fish region, most of the tendon tissue is from cranial neural crest that is labeled by Saxton. So whether this is the case during the regeneration, so to label the Saxton lineage, we use the Saxton GFP fish that can label the chondrocyte and the perichondrocyte. And this is immediately after ablation, so there's no tendon cell. So what we did is we took a live imaging and look at the regeneration in this area. For example, we noticed during the regeneration, some of the Saxton positive cell downregulate Saxton expression and turning on tendon marker and become tendon cell. 
And in this area, in this area, there is also some succinct negative cell that can turn on succinct expression and it becomes a tendon cell. And to confirm this phenomenon, we use the succinct cray ER titoli that can allow us to label the succinct derived tissue. And as a result, we found that some of the new cell could be derived from this lineage. So this data is showing in the cartilage attachment site, the succinct lineage is a cellular resource. So what about the cell regeneration in the muscle attachment site? So if you look at it over here, this is the muscle junction area. From there we can see there are some new cell gradually induced in this region, you can see here. So the question is where they are from and uh, what is their identity? So when we thought about the cellular resource in this area, we were thinking about a potential mesoderm contribution to this area. So the, the reason for that is, so in the unabrated fish, for example, in the normal fish, in, in this area, when we cross our tendon cell ablation line to a NKX 2.5 ZS yellow line that labels the lateral plate mesoderm derived tissue, we notice in the muscle attachment side, some of the tendon cell could be labeled by this lineage. And there's also some NKX 2.5 only cell you can see here, which is in green. So the question is, if we try to remove the tendon cell, whether this green cell can give rise to new tendon cell. So we did an experiment. That is, we first try to remove the tendon cell. You can see there's only green cell left. And after four days, we try to image the same area. And very surprisingly, we notice some of the green cell can turn on tendon marker expression and it become tendon cell. And then to confirm this phenotype, we use the NKX 2.5 Creer titulite that can label the derived tissue. And we found in the muscle attachment side, some of the tendon cell could be from this, this lineage. So this is showing different from the cartilage attachment site. In the muscle attachment site, the mesoderm derived tissue can give rise to the tendon cell. So then we were trying to ask uh, what is the molecular pathway that can regulate this process and can regulate the progenitor cell activity in the junction area. So what we did is we try to cross our tendon cell ablation line to each of the reporter line that is labeled by GFP. So as a result, uh, we found uh, there's, because, so the idea is that if, if this pathway respond to the ablation and the regeneration. So you should be able to see the GIP change. And as a result, we notice there's no change of the notch, hedgehog, and the wind pathway. However, we did see some change from the BMP pathway. For example, if you look at it over here, this is the DMSO control, and this is a sternal hyoides tendon, and you have the basal level of the BMP signal, which is labeled by a BMP reporter line. So brain is for BMP response element. So in the MTZ treated fish, when you ablate the tendon, you can at the same time activate the BMP signal. You can see here. So next we were trying to ask whether the BMP is required for the regeneration. So we use, we try to use two strategy to answer this, this question. So first of all, we use a BMP inhibitor that is LDN193, and the treat the ablated fish. And uh, this is a DMSO control, this is the BMP inhibitor. And uh, we try to quantify the cell number in the sternal hyoides tendon region, and uh, we compare between the uh, DMSO and the BMP inhibitor. And uh, we found uh, if you block the BMP pathway, you are able to block the tendon cell regeneration. And uh, then we try to uh, use the transgenic strategy that is mediated by heat shock norgin 3 which is also a BMP inhibitor. So after ablation, we heat shock the, the fish embryo that is either car carrying or not carrying the transgene. 
and we compare between these two treatments. And uh, consistent with the chemical inhibition, you can see if you activate a heat shock norgin 3 you can also block the cell regeneration. And then we were trying to ask something different. That is, if we try to activate a BMP pathway, how the regeneration would be like. So to activate the BMP pathway, we use the heat shock BMP to be like, which is a great gift from the uh, Roman lab. So you see here, if you activate a BMP pathway, you are making more tendon progenitor cells. This is very interesting. So next, uh, we trying to ask uh, how the BMP exactly regulate the regeneration. So to answer that question, we try to look at the relationship between the BMP signal and the new tendon cell. For example, in the cartilage attachment site, you can see the new tendon cell, and we notice most of the cell is active in BMP signal. And this is also true in the muscle attachment site. You can see the new tendon cell which turning on BMP signal. And to confirm this, we also use the antibody that is for forceful SMAD15, which is a downstream BMP factor. So you can see here in the cartilage attachment site, the new tendon cell can express the forceful SMAD1. And this is also true in the muscle attachment site. You can see the co-overlapping between the cell. So this is showing the BMP regulated regeneration by controlling the progenitor cell activity. So whether this is the truth, so then we design an experiment. What we did is we tried to use either DMSO or BMP inhibitor to the fish and then look at the regeneration in the local area. So in the top of panel is the cartilage attachment site and the bottom is the muscle attachment site. And then we look at the, the, the tendon cell regeneration that is from the succinct lineage. For example, when we compare with the DMSO control, if you block a BMP pathway, you can block the cell formation that is from the succinct lineage. And in the muscle attachment site, if you try to block the BMP pathway, you are going to block the cell formation that is from the NKX 2.5 derived tissue. So this is showing in this area, the progenitor cell is the direct target of BMP pathway that can be controlled by BMP signal. So here I'm going to use this slide to summarize what we found. So basically in the zebrafish, we generate a transgenic light that can allow us to look at the tendon cell. And then use this light, we try to ablate the tendon cell. And then we try to look for the cellular resource during this process. And uh, so to look for the cellular resource, we focus on two regions. So the first one is the cartilage attachment site. And the second one is the muscle attachment site. And in the cartilage site, we notice the cellular resource is a substance positive cell that can become tendon cell. And in the muscle attachment site, we notice the NKX 2.5 derived labeled mesoderm tissue is the cellular resource. So here I'd like to mention this tendon, which is called a sternal hyoidus tendon. It is very unique that it has two germ layer uh, contribution. So in the anterior region, it is, it is from the neural crest, which is labeled by Soxton. And in the muscle junction area, it is from the mesoderm that is labeled by NKX 2.5. And during this process, the BMP is regulating the progenitor activity that can promote a regeneration. So over the next three weeks, the zebrafish can regenerate the normal distribution of the tendon cell. However, at this time point, uh, their tendon tissue are still growing. And only after six months, they could be functional. So I'd like to stop here and uh, I'd like to thank many people. So first of all, I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Jana Garvey, and who is very supportive and encouraging. And uh, I also want to thank everyone in our lab for their advice and uh, their help. And uh, there, there are actually many other people 
who contributed to this project. And I appreci appreciate that very much. So I'll stop here and uh, I'd like to take your question. Great, right. thank you Zhubo for that wonderful presentation. So we'll go ahead and take questions from the Q&A box. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and put those in there. And I'll start by asking one from our audience member, Chris Wright. So it looks like this question has two parts. I'll start with the first question and then I'll come back and ask the second part. So his first question is, can one kill tendon cells and then regenerate them, kill them again and get a second round of regeneration? Uh, very good question. And uh, we, I would say we never do that experiment. Uh, it's very possible in the embryonic stage because the, the fish are highly regenerative. But it would be very interesting to look at it. We, we don't know. We, we just, I, I just thought it could be possible. All right. Um, and his second question is um, relating to, do we know if there's a stage at which regeneration stops being efficient um, in the life of the fish? Uh, or can you still see this regenerative process in adult animals? Uh, yeah, so so we have the data and uh, I'm just not showing it here. So we can try to ablate the fish, ablate the tendon cell in juvenile stage and the adult stage. And uh, we also observe re regeneration. So the only difference is they take a much longer to be back. So this is also a question asked by a reviewer, but I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure they can. All right. So, oh gosh, we have lots of questions. Hopefully we'll get to all of them, but if we don't, um, Zhubo will definitely try to come in after his talk and answer some of these um, by typing in answers. So our next yeah. question is from Martin Aristuigi. I Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, he says, great talk. I'm wondering about the regeneration of te the tendon body. Neurocrest cell derived cells contribute to cartilage end and mesoderm derived cells contribute to muscle attachment site. So what about the middle? So the, the middle part of the tendon body? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say, so the mesoderm just uh, contribute to a very small part of the muscle area. So in the mid body, it is also derived from the neural crest, both in development and the regeneration. Yeah. All right. So our next question is from Bridget Hogan. She asks, what cells are making the BMP ligand? And if the collagen matrix doesn't change, how does the fish know the tendon cells are missing? Uh, very amazing question. This is a question that the reviewer also asked. So, so far, so I can see we look at the, all of the ligand and the receptor gene expression, and we notice that BMP2B and the BMP receptor 1BA are expressed surrounding the attachment site. Mm -hmm. But we still don't know what, which cell expressed the BMP2B. Uh, that's a good question. We don't know. So we just know it could be our tendon progenitor cell or the target cell that express BMP receptor, but uh, we are still looking for the, like the ligand cell, which okay. is secret the BMP like ligand. Oh, the second question is, uh, so after tendon cell ablation, we notice the, the collagen fibril is also disrupted, and uh, we we use a multi photon microscopy, look at the morphology, and uh, we notice they become shorter and uh, thinner, uh, but uh, they are still there. So if you ask me how the fish know whether the tendon is missing, because I I, I can try to answer, because after tendon cell ablation, the fish try not to swim, so they they tend to stay in the bottom. So I guess they, I mean, they are not as active as the like normal control. So I guess that could uh, be like a sensor that um, them know this, there's something going wrong with the tendon or just tendon junction area. So 
they are making more like like making new tendon tissue. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. All right. So Lily's asking, uh, do the terminally differentiated cells de-differentiate? Are these cells positionally specific? Uh, I'm wondering is he is she asking the other like a differentiated cell like a chondrocyte or just a tendon cell? Be because we 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 never so during the tendon cell regeneration we never notice like a trans differentiation from the other tissue, yeah. and uh, you know that so the the thing is the tendon tissue is very different because. Even in the mature tendon, they still express the progenitor marker like sclerosis. So it's very hard to know whether they really go back to a differentiation state. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So our next question is from Anastasia Polikarpova. Um, thank you for a great presentation and great work. Just out of curiosity, do you know which progenitors are essential for the tendon regeneration in mammals? Uh, good question. This is a good question in the tendon field. And uh, so in the, in the mouse, if you try to like injure the tendon tissue, so in the mouse, they're, they're, they're actually inside of the tendon tissue, there's progenitor like stem or progenitor cell population, but uh, surrounding the tendon tissue, like in the tendon thesis, there's also some progenitor cell. So that could be the cellular resource that can migrate into the injured tissue, injured area and it contribute to regeneration. There, there's paper showing that. All right. Yeah. Um, and Clarissa Covney asks, did you only kill tenocytes at three days post-fertilization or did you try any later than that? Um, once the cartilage ossifies, does the pool of stem cells diminish? I'm wondering about the regenerative capacity of tenocytes and tendons in adults. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's a question. So, so I would say yes. So we, like I said, I mentioned earlier, we can ablate the tendon cell in all stage from embryo to adult. And they can also regenerate at all stage. So, so like the, the, the difference is in adult, they just uh, like take, take more time to be regenerated. That is what we observed, but they can, yeah. Nice. All right, and I think we have time for one more question and then we'll send the rest of them so that Jubo can answer them afterwards. Uh, so Neil McCarthy asks, any idea of the phosphosmad targets during regeneration? So I think he's asking probably downstream, uh, downstream targets of the SMAD signaling. Uh, yes. Uh, so this is a very challenging question. Mm. <laughs> So I guess I would see the, so, you know, there are some SOX10 positive cell in the cartilage attachment site or NKX 2.5 in the muscle attachment site. This could be the SMAD target cell that can be activated by BMP. But uh, there could be other like targets we, we don't know, but a very good question, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Jubo. I think we'll go ahead and yeah. move on to our second speaker now. Thank you. Okay, so it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker of the day, who is Soledad Reyes de Mochel. Uh, Soledad did her PhD work at UC Irvine with Ken Cho, uh, and there she studied the regulation of cell division and cell fate specification in the early mouse embryo. Um, she's now a postdoc with Tian Peng at UC San Francisco, and today she's going to be talking about her work in that lab um, on a reparative niche in the lung basement membrane. So, Salvador, take it away. Uh, thank you, Adam, for um, your introduction, and thank you for the organizers for selecting me to have an opportunity to share my work with you. Um, as Adam mentioned, I'll be talking about this very interesting new role that we found for P16 expressing mesenchymal cells in the adult lung. And 
this work has been possible um, since because of a discovery that was done in the early 1960s. Um, so there are some experiments being conducted um, looking at human diploid cell lines in vitro. And what was discovered is, um, as we know, there's a certain gr uh, growth associated with primary cells. If um, the cells become an established cell line, there's uh, they entered this what is called a second phase where they're just going to continue to proliferate. But what was absorbed was that there is the uh, cell population that actually were mitotically inactive. They remained alive and they avoid apoptosis. So since these discoveries, we've learned so much more and we've known that cells could actually enter this state called senescence. And we also know that they're very active in terms of their microenvironment where they're located. So they're not just these cells that are, um, are cell arrested and not doing much and eventually accumulate with age. They're actually pretty active in what they do. So some of the common uh, tumor suppressors or cell cycling inhibitors utilized by senescent cells are P21, P53, and P16. Um, there's other characteristics that um, contribute to the senescent phenotype. In the context of aging, there seems to be more DNA damage accumulation. Um, there's different molecular regulators that are utilized with senescent cells. And in some, they get very enlarged lysosomal compartments that allows them to be detected through a SA beta gal assay. Um, nonetheless, there's different combinations of senescent cells throughout our tissues in the body and throughout a lifetime of an organism. Um, there are things that are in similar with senescent cells and there are other things that are not. Um, but what one of the major things they have in common is that they are releasing a SASP. And this is an array of cytokines, growth factors into the microenvironment. Um, and there's a consequence of having those. There's interaction with the immune system. There's remodeling of um, the extracellular matrix, for example. And so what we, how we learned about senescent cells in an in vitro culture, and um, we, we are learning that there is some consequences, some good in the short term um, consequences, such as taking pulls out of the metodic cycle that are not necessarily good for division and they can lead to cancer. Um, but in the long term, it seems like accumulating these cells um, can lead to very uh, detrimental very bad consequences. For example, it can um, form tumors by sending out very pro-inflammatory signals into the microenvironment. And they're attributed to a lot of organ decline that associated with age. And this idea that senescent cells are bad and we need to remove them in the context of aging got, became really solidified with two key experiments from different laboratories where they took two reporter mouse um, that have suicide genes to get rid of all senescent cells and they utilized the tumor suppressor P16 to drive the expression of two very distinct um, suicide genes. The Incatec animal and the 3MR collectively both showed that um, if you remove the senescent cells from the aging animals, you actually can reverse some of these aging consequences. So they have um, lack of thinning of the skin and improved in the health span to overall of the animals. So the association between senescent cells perhaps being really bad, maybe having a good role in um, the younger organism, became quite strong here that you don't want senescent cells later in, in life. So indeed, there's a whole field of uh, called senolytics where individuals are trying to find compounds that can target and identify individual senescent cells in vivo. Um, nonetheless, we are learning so much about senescent cells and I beg that there's still so much more to be learned. Um, we know that they have very distinct functions. Senescent cells have been identified in early development. In fact, it's uh, the state of senescence seems to be thought of uh, part of the developmental process where it can help tissues pattern. It can help with growth. Um, we, as I mentioned, um, senescent cells are highly associated with what we called oncogenic induced senescence. And we have, um, replicative senescence was more attributed to aging. So what I want to really highlight here is that um, there's senescence 
cells come in various colors, let's say. They have um, very distinct characteristics depending in where in the lifetime of the organism. They don't always share the same characteristics. So it makes it quite hard to really study them and identify it in vivo. Um, but nonetheless, we took up the challenge we were quite interesting to know um, what is the role of these senescent cells or more particularly p16 expressing cells in the non-age tissues given that a lot of the information that we know about them has been in either in vitro or in the context of aging so to do this we needed to generate a very ultra sensitive um, P16 reporter line. We called um, this animal the ink bright, and we used a very similar approach as the ink attack and TMR animals, where we took the P16 five, five prime arm to drive the expression of three histone T E G F P proteins in tandem. So I'm going to take a second to walk you through the anatomy just quickly of the lung to help you better orient with the images I'm going to show later. So from proximal to distal lung, you have um, the the major airways. And um, what we focus in the pain lab for this project is looking at um, the very proximal epithelial, which aligns the airway tube and the mesenchymal, the supporting tissue that is around the epithelium. And um, if you would do a cross section of this in close box, then you can see the epithelium with many club cells, ciliated cells, and the progenitors. Um, and right below that, you have the best basement membrane in the mesenchyme. So once we generated the animals, we were really excited to see if we can actually detect through histology um, these GFP or P16 expressing cells. And we were able to find um, their expression to be located right below the epithelial progenitor cells, so predominantly in the mesenchyme chymal populations, as denoted here in green, and the epithelium is in red. So we became really curious to see how early we can detect this P16 expressing cells in the mouse. And we looked at embryonic stages and we did not detect any P16 expressing cells at that time, which agrees what people have published that in early embryonic development, the P21 and P15 are the predominant tumor suppressors utilized by senescent cells there. We found them as early as postnatal day five in this, uh, their expression right below the epithelial epithelium uh, persist through avial genesis. And we found them at postnatal day 14 and throughout adulthood. We are able, since this is a very sensitive reporter, we're able to actually dissociate the cells in the lung and try to assess in what population um, do we find most of them in. So we found them in the immune population. We found a little bit in the endothelial population and in the mesenchyme who we further uh, segregated by PDGFR alpha stain. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'll refer to the mesenchyme as those cells from the lung that are immune epithelial endothelial cell negative PDGFR alpha positive. So it was great. We found that we can actually identify um, P16 expressing cells within tissues. We can isolate them. So now we can interrogate them at the single cell level. But we were interested to know if they're actually actively expressing P16 or not just some point in their lifetime express P16. So I uh, isolated the cells and did a qPCR and found that a big increase in the trans Script. So it tells, tells us that they're actually actively reporting the expression of P16. And so one of the questions that drove us into this project was to try to understand um, their function and their identity of these P16 expressing cells in vivo. So one of the key things about senescent cell is that they are believed as being irreversible. Um, they cannot, from the cell cycle, they can not come back once they go in. So we were very curious about the replicative capacity of these cells in vivo. So we took animals during abiogenesis and hemostasis and we treated them with BRDO. And we were simply asking for a period of time, we were asking what cells in the mesenchyme, um, specifically the PDGR alpha express mesenchyme, um, uh, are taking up BRDU. So we subdivided those PDGR alpha positive cells below the airway into 
P16 expressing, which is a GFP positive and non-expressing cells. And um, what we found is uh, there seems to be a, a reduction of BRDU incorporation in the P16 expressing cells, but they, there are some cells that, that do take it up. Um, so the lung is a very quiescent organ, so it doesn't really proliferate unless you do some sort of injury and have a reason to proliferate. And so we wanted to um, develop an in vivo sort of proliferation challenge where if we do an injury in the animals, can we see if there's more proliferation in these cells? So what we chose to use this anaphylene injury. So this compound is uh, differentially metabolized by the epithelium and mesenchymal cells of the lung. Um, the epithelium taken in the enzyme can break it down and actually they will die within 24 hours. It's almost like you rip the airways. Um, and there's a wave of proliferation thereafter to replenish um, the epithelial cells and also within the supporting mesenchymal cells. So we took our ink pride animals, we injured them and shortly right after injury, we treated them with BRDU for 14 days. And then we collected the tissue and analyzed very similarly um, the PDGR alpha population. And what we saw is that with the injury, we have a big surge of GFP negative or non-P16 expressing mesenchymal cells that are proliferating, but we don't see that with the P16 expressing cells. And so let us to think of them, maybe they're these very hypoproliferative population of cells um, in the adult lung. So we wanted to take a look at other uh, features of senescence. And in oncogenic senescence, there are some reportings of maybe, uh, cells being polyploidy. So we took, a, we did cytospins to freshly uh, sorted cells and we took a look. And we, what we found was that there is an increase of these double uh, nucleated enlarged cells um, in the P16 expressing population. We took advantage of our facts data and we did uh, an analysis of the forward scattered and we did indeed see that the GFP positive or P16 expressing cells are a lot bigger as been reported in senescent cells. And here's quantification for that. We repeated this analysis by giving the cells an opportunity to expand in vitro. So we sorted the cells, we let them settle, did a Philodian stain to, and simply just outline and see how uh, their size was. And they are actually also a lot bigger in vitro. So we wanted to continue. Um, so it seems like these cells, we can isolate them. They have features of senescence, some which I'm not showing here, but we wanted to move forward to actually identifying them. So we took a sequencing approach. We did a single cell seek of the uh, uninjured and injured animals. And like we saw in the facts, majority of these live GFP positive cells are immune cells and fibroblast cells. Um, with the injury, we do see a very big increase of the immune cell population. We have uh, inflammatory monocytes and circulating B cells that are coming in into the lung after injury. Um, we subdivided the mesenchyme because that's the tissue or the cell types that we're interested in into the major unknown um, types of mesenchymal cells. And it seems like um, there is distribution of P16 cells and throughout the uh, different types of mesenchymal cells. We did single cell, our, our bulk RNA-seq out of our time course to try to um, identify a pattern in their gene expression. What we found is that in the GFP expressing cells, there are epigenetic modifiers, microRNAs that are known to regulate P16 to be coined as upstream regulators by IPA analysis. And CD, P16 itself is also named one. But what we found really interesting was this wave of activation of N of kappa signaling throughout um, the time course, in particular day 14. So it seems like the injury is causing the P16 expressing cells to shift into this pro-inflammatory phenotype. We use a phantom five libraries to look at the secreted ligands and compare them with our data sets. And we found that the ligand secretion increases with 
uh, the injury time cores, suggesting that perhaps these cells are responding to the injury, becoming more inflammatory and sending out signals into the microenvironment. So we wanted to test if this is the case, what is the consequence of having these signals? So we use a 3D organoid model where we co-culture mesenchymal cells that are expressing P16 or not with epithelial cells um, that are tagged with TD tomato. And what we found is without injury, there is no difference between the growth of epithelium that is co-cultured with mesenchyme that is P16 positive or negative. And I should add that the epithelium will not grow without the mesenchyme in this setting. But at day seven post-injury, the mesenchyme that's GFP positive P16 expressing seems to drive growth of the epithelium better than its GFP negative counterpart in the same at day 14. We were curious to see, well, it seems like these P16 cells are sending out signals. What are those signals? So we cross-reference again um, our ligand library and we identified three possible targets and we selected EREG or epiregulin. We uh, did qPCR to confirm that epiregulin is actually being produced by the mesenchymal cells and it seems like its, its production is uh, in response to the nephling injury. We repeated organoids where we played around with mechanism. We took GFP negative mesenchyme, we treated with EREG, and we do see increase in the organoid number, although no size, but number. And then we did the inverse with GFP positive mesenchyme. We treated with the organoids with the fatinib, an inhibitor of um, EGFR and ERB4, who are the receptors that epiregulin works through. And finally, we went to an in vivo model where we got EREG knock out animals and we injure them with nephilim, collected tissues 14 days, and we do see uh, some retardation of the uh, regeneration of the epithelium. So finally, we wanted to see if P16, the gene itself, had a role in um, the regeneration process and feeding back to the epithelium. So we took a very broad approach. We used a conditional CRE, dermal CRE, to that it's a predominantly a mesenchymal CRE and to get rid of P16. Um, and we looked at the uninjured or lungs and hemostasis, there's really no difference between the uh, epithelial cells, so it didn't affect through abiogenesis or development. And when I injure these animals, I do see a uh, um, lack of repair of the epithelium with the injury when there is no P16 in the uh, lungs. We tried this with a little bit more refined. We chose uh, another Cre driver that is predominantly around the airways. This is the Glee one Cre RT system. And this time we injured the animals after induction and we gave them BRDU. And so the results of that is that we can see that our knockout animal, the mesenchymal tissue right below the airways actually is proliferating more when you re take away P16. We see that um, there is a uh, after the nephilim injury, we also see that there is a lack of um, regeneration of the epithelium as seen with a dermal cre. And we also found that these GLE-1 P16 knockout cells are actually producing less EREG into the microenvironment. So with that, I, uh, I'll share, conclude with this model that we have so far of the role of P16 positive cells. So, so far we think we identified that there is a submesenchymal population um, in really throughout the mesenchymal regions that have um, some features of senescence. These cells are polynucleated, they seem to be enlarged, and they're very responsive to an injury. They seem to go into a pro-inflammatory uh, phenotype where now they're secreting more what we think is the SASP into the microenvironment. One of those uh, was the uh, growth factor epiregulin that seems to be playing a role in actually helping the epithelial progenitor Janitors repopulate the airway epithelium. And so with that, i like to thank my mentor, T.M. Pang, that has been amazing and driving um, great science in the lab, and all of my lab members that are so supportive through um, the revision, revision process of this work. Um, and also thank you, everyone, for your attention. I'll take questions now. OK, thank you, Soledad, for a really nice talk. Um, and I'll remind everyone in the audience to go ahead and put your questions in the uh, Q&A box. So we've got a couple here. 
Uh, first question from Chris Wright. How could you really show that cells don't move in and out of a P16 on or high state? Um, don't you need a P16 ERT pulse chaseable allele? Yeah, so with this reporter, we can only show the cells that are reporting P16, but we don't know if throughout their lifetime they stopped reporting and then they picked it up again. Um, we have, we're generating tools in the lab. We have a P16 Cree ERT reporter that now we're playing and repeating some of these experiments with, but not with this one, but there's other, um, a recent one uh, reporter line has been available as last year. Um, next question from Praveer Sharma, uh, great talk. Loss of recovery potential from injury is a characteristic of aging. If senescent cells are important for injury recovery in the lung, is the lung an exception to this general rule or do the senescent cells lose their secretory role in older animals? Oh, hi, Praveer, it's good to hear a question from you. Um, that's a, a great question. We started this project a couple of years ago. So now we have um, an aging ink bright population where we can actually begin to look at the differences between a young P16 positive cell mesenchymal cell versus an old one. So we have the same questions like, do they perform the same? Are they even helpful during the regenerative process? Uh, are they senescent in a different way just because they're in the context of aging? Is their SAFs gonna be different from a younger uh, P16 expressing mesenchymal cell? So unfortunately I don't have the answers now, um, but this is something that I'm, my future direction I'm working on. Okay, um, a question from Bridget Hogan. Uh, interesting results. Do you see similar cells in the human lung and how do they relate to airway smooth muscle? So the, for the first part, um, we're trying to devise a way to actually isolate um, similar cells in the human lung. Unfortunately, we can't tag cells the way we can do it with animals. So one of the features of these P16 expressing cells, but they're actually bigger in size. So some of the experiments we're ongoing in the lab is we are actually just flat out sorting and separating our lung populations based on their size. And then looking at these characteristics of senescence, if the bigger cells, mesenchymal cells are, um, express more 16, more of these classical senescent markers? Do they have more polyploidy? Um, how do they behave in culture as well? So we're hoping that we can translate that into the human um, lung as well. Um, and I'm sorry, Adam, can you repeat the last part of the section of the question? Yeah, so it was, how do they relate to airway smooth muscle? How do the mesenchymal cells relate to them? Or P16 expressing cells in the, uh, are they in the smooth muscle cells? Sorry. Uh, I'll have to ask. I need a little bit, sorry, a, uh, Dr. Hogan. I need a little bit more clarification on the question. Um, so why don't I ask you another question and, and we can come back if, okay. if she follows up. Um, so from Augusto Granillo, nice talk. How specific is this to the airways? Do you think there may be similar cellular interactions in the gut maybe? Mm. Um, we, that's a really good question. We also have taken um, intestines, large and the colon and found these cells there, but we have not gone into doing any functional studies in um, the uh, intestines, but this is something that we were hoping to collaborate with and, and get started. I will say that um, we also wanna try different injuries in the lung because we uh, have this phenotype with um, airway epithelium. So we want to know what about if we do, for example, a very fibrotic injury like bleomycin in the animals, is the P16 mesenchymal cells in the distal lung also as supportive with the epithelium there, or do they actually hurt the situation and cause more fibrosis? So this is uh, something that would be interesting to investigate. Okay, um, a follow-up to that smooth muscle airway smooth muscle question. Uh, so here's the follow-up. Are they physically close to the smooth muscle, for example? Uh, some are, yes. Uh, some of these, uh, so 
I can, I can try to see if I can go back to um, the P16 express in medicine chymal cells actually are in composite um, the major um, mesenchymal cells in the lung. So we have the bronchial uh, fibroblasts here in yellow, as you can see, they are um, very close. In, in some cases, they can be themselves expressing P16. And then they're also, the adventitial um, mesenchymal population is right below the airways. And then we also find them in the alveolar. Um, so to answer your question, they are P16 expressing smooth muscle cells, and then there are mesenchymal cells that are close to them as well in the bronchial regions. Uh, okay, a question from uh, Lily Wong. In the P16 conditional knockout animals, uh, upon airway injury, was there a reduction in inflammatory response and thus a reduction in regeneration? Um, that is a very good question in terms of a reduction in the inflammatory response. Um, one of the reviewers actually had <laughs> asking that. So what we're doing right now to address this question, actually we send off samples from the control and um, the dermal Cree mutant animals um, for sequencing to try to get at what is the differences in the SASP? Why do we, don't we see epithelial regeneration? Is it because these mesenchymal cells are not sending out the right signals? So uh, pending. <laughs> okay. uh, another question from Neil McCarthy about P16 loss. So I might've missed this, but P16 loss leads to misregulation of senescence. Um, does this lead to hyperproliferation of those cells? Uh, you're referred as a knock-in. Have you verified this with in C2s? I think this is two different questions. So does it lead to hyperproliferation of these cells? So we, this GLEE-1 experiment um, that we did in vivo, the mesenchymal cells um, below the airway tend to take up a lot more um, BRDU. So for this model, I can say yes, it seems like removing P16 in the adventitial or the proximal mesenchymal populations causes an increase in proliferation. Um, what would be nice, another layer of um, information would be nice if I had crossed this with the ink bright animal um, to really just say, well, who in the Glee one population is doing most proliferation? Okay, um, and then this is another question. So your report is a knock-in. Have you verified with in situs? It's not seem very specific when comparing mesenchymal cell populations, i.e. PDGRF, PDGFRA positive versus CD45 positive. Yeah, so um, I will make a clarification. This is a back transgenic, um, so it's not a knock-in animal. Um, I did mention the knock-in with the P16 Cree RT animal with a suicide gene that we're generating, but this is, again, it's not um, a knock-in. Now, what was the latter part of the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, have you verified with in situs um, and uh, it does not seem very specific when comparing mesenchymal cell populations, i.e. PDGFRA positive versus CD45 positive. Yeah, so we, the first um, just transcript readout that I did with, and I showed for this talk um, was of all life GFP positive cells, but we actually have separated the immune or the CD45 positive population and the mesenchymal population. Um, but I uh, have not gotten a good probe for P16 to work with RNA scope, um, but that was one of our, um, our goals. Okay. Um, and then I have a question for you. So um, it seems like the, the senescent cells are performing this function of um, you know, promoting growth after injury. Is there a clear answer in your mind as to what, whether there's a link between that function and the fact that they are senescent? Is there something about senescence that allows them to play that role? I think so. So I were referring to these cells as sentinel cells. So we think that the fact that these cells are not actively part of the other mesenchymal cells in the lung, they are there perhaps to sense in a situation where there's injury or is there's a need for aid to the microenvironment for growth. Um, and I believe 
um, some people are ex studying these P60 or expressing senescent cells in the context of fibrosis as well to see how they actually are shooting out a lot of things into the microenvironment that causes um, unnecessary growth in that case. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, there are a couple other questions, but we're out of time. So hopefully we can find a way for you to answer those. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank both of our speakers today, Shuo and Soledad for excellent talks. Uh, this seminar has been recorded and will be available on the SDB website starting on Monday. Um, and a reminder to please join us for next month's seminar on Friday, April 9th, when Kara Moravec from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Brandon Carpenter from Emory University will present. So thanks everyone for joining us today and I hope you have a good weekend.